The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us in our third installment of the Strategic Financial Leadership Webinar Series. Today is part three, Strategies to Survive the Cyclical Nature of the Landscape Industry. I have today with me um, Steve Coffrin at the uh, Cultivar Group. My name is Joe Salemi. I'm the Product Marketing Manager here with Dynascape Software. Um, we're really excited to uh, bring this partnership uh, to the Dynascape community um, with the Cultivar Group and Steve. Uh, Steve's been a really great guy to partner with. Uh, and he brings a real wealth of expertise to the landscape industry. If you haven't had a chance to talk to Steve, I'd really recommend um, getting a hold of him and seeing how you can uh, really uh, up your game with uh, his expertise. So just a little bit uh, before we start uh, in our third installment here, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, all three webinars are being recorded, so we recorded the first two. Um, they've been posted to the Dynascape website by now. Everyone should have the link, um, but shortly after this webinar, I will uh, be posting it to our website, and I'll send it out to everyone again. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. We will have time for Q&A at the end of this webinar. So, Steve, I'm sure we're going to have quite a few questions that pop up, so we'll be able to uh, answer those. And, uh, again, if, uh, if, you know, if we don't get to you in that Q&A, um, our email addresses will be on the screen, so please uh, feel free to shoot us an email, and uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Use that Excellent. question inbox to, to do that. So in the, in the GoToWebinar control panel, there is a little spot, a little box, uh, four questions. So type your questions there and that's how uh, we'll be able to get those answered. Steve, it's time to pass it over to you. I'm going to give you the, con the controls and uh, we'll get into the great content you have planned for us today. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. All right, can you see my screen there? Yeah, I can see it live. Here we go. All right, perfect. Well, yeah, welcome everybody to this this uh, third webinar um, series. I'm grateful once again to be able to talk on a topic that I'm very, very passionate about, strategy. And especially uh, a follow-up from our last week where we talked about the financial principles, there is definitely an intersection of where companies thrive, which is where, which that intersection is strategy and finance. And companies that try to improve their, their cash flows or their profitabilities without strategy, they tend to suffer. And then the companies that create strategies that don't tie in the financial piece tend not to execute well. So I, I'm glad that we're wrapping this series um, all together with this very, very pertinent topic, strategy, and strategies to survive the cyclical nature of the landscape industry. So welcome everybody, and um, I'm very, very grateful to be speaking to you guys here. For... So what we'll do here, um, my bio, I'll, I'll just put on the, um, the screen here, and you feel free to take a look at it. Um, but you can look me up on LinkedIn. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. I, I have industry background. I've been in the landscape industry uh, as a business owner for 13 years myself, and then I've been working with companies for the past decade. So this is uh, my baby. This is the, the industry that I love. But yeah, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, and, and you could find um, more information about me if, if you want out there. But I'm not going to waste a lot of time, especially because a lot of people, I'm sure, are returning from previous webinars. Yeah, and if you want to if you want to know more uh, about Steve, uh, in the link that I've sent around to everyone, and um, that I will send around to everyone on the uh, web page where the recordings are, there's a great bio and uh, links to Steve's website and LinkedIn and uh, his different social media uh, channels. So feel free to get in touch with him. Great, thank you so much, Joe. And so let's hop right into it, and let's really look at what's going on in our industry. What's the context, what's the background, and what kind of forces are impacting the way that we compete and the way that we run our businesses in the landscape industry? So what I did here on this slide is I put together a number of external forces that impact our industry and impact the way that customers interact with us 
and the way that they buy our products. So the first thing that I want to bring up is just the value of private non-residential construction. So non-residential construction, another way of saying that is commercial construction or industrial construction. So if you look at the, the amount of construction that's being put in place across the country and even up into Canada um, and other parts of the world, construction is booming right now. And the reason why is because interest rates are low, um, so people are investing in new buildings, uh, population continues to expand, and this is causing uh, commercial construction to take off. Uh, a lot of general contractors we work in the space of, of construction so we work with landscape companies and we work with uh, construction companies general contractors and other specialty companies but all the general contractors that we are working with they're experiencing record-breaking backlogs and a tremendous growth when it comes to um, to overall growth in the the commercial realm of things when you look at the residential construction same kind of thing is occurring and what's interesting is that especially in places like Colorado, we have a huge housing shortage. So the value of uh, residential construction has shot up. Home prices have um, increased significantly, and this is across the the country. And and what this is causing is that a lot of homeowners they are now experiencing a tremendous growth in their equity of their home, and this is causing them to um, do a lot of refinancing. And pulling that equity out of their home to do projects such as landscaping, landscape construction, doing design build work, and other renovations throughout the house. So um, the reason why I bring this up is because it's important to understand these external forces and what's driving consumer demand. Uh, households are earning more than $100,000 a year. Uh, that trend is increasing as corporate corporate earnings increase out there, they can pay their employees more, and then people have more disposable income to uh, spend on services such as landscaping, uh, once again. And then finally, uh, government consumption and investment. The government is spending quite a bit of money in infrastructure, and this is gonna cause uh, a need for greater landscaping as new buildings and new projects go online. So all of these five different components are really driving uh, consumer demand in our space. These are the forces that we really need to be paying attention to. Back to the residential side, I imagine most people on the phone today uh, play in the residential space, especially design build. And when you look at what's going on, I, I, I saw a Wall Street Journal article uh, a, a few weeks back and it was talking about how there's a record-breaking number of refis occurring across the country. So as people are refinancing their homes, like I said, they're stripping out equity, uh, they're taking advantage of lower interest rates, and this is really causing a boom in the landscape industry. Some things that you definitely need to be paying attention to, and I, I threw a few graphs up here. A lot of these graphs we send out to our clients, um, these are specific to Colorado, so you could pull up your own, but I, I wanted to show you a few uh, as an example, and feel free to, to take these links and customize it to your own company. Down below, you'll see the link of where you can find this information. The key here is that when you go to the link, uh, the government reports these numbers on a month-over-month -month basis. You need to convert them over to a trailing 12-month basis. So when you see up above where it says building permits uh, trailing TTM, that stands for trailing 12 months. And what this means is that each green bar represents one year of data. So if you look to the far left, September 2006, you'll notice that there are close to 20,000 permits that were pulled from October 2005 through September 2006. So each bar represents one year of building permits pulled. When you look at it on a trailing 12-month basis, it eliminates seasonality and it gives you a better um, understanding of what's really trending. And this is what I talked about last week in the financial management um, webinar, is about looking at things on a trailing 12-month basis. So here, uh, if you're looking at building permits, which is a leading indicator, if you think about build, building permits, uh, whether it's residential, commercial, builders are pulling these permits uh, far in advance, they, they finally break ground, they build the job, and then at the end we come in with landscaping, this is definitely a leading indicator that you can use to be more predictive in your company and more strategic. But what's fascinating is 
back in 2006 in September, you notice number of building permits started to decline very, very sharply. Well, fat back, go um, rewind back to 2006 where I was. I, I had my uh, design build company. And we were having a record-breaking year. I mean, people were spending 300 grand on their landscape, like it was no big deal. They were burning money, um, like uh, it's going out of style. So in 2006, I wasn't smart enough to be pulling this information. That's why I'm sharing with it with you now, because this would have been great to have. But at the time, I was just going off what our backlog was, and we were booked out a year um, with a construction job. So immediately. I relied on uh, my gut reaction and went out there and, and bought a bunch of equipment and to uh, to deal with the demand. But in retrospect, if I would have looked at a chart like this, I would have seen very quickly that uh, month over month over month over month, uh, building permits were trending down and to maybe practice a little bit more caution when it came to creating a strategic plan. So that, definitely look at building permits in your area because this is going to be a leading indicator and you'll see where the market's going. The other thing I'll point out on these graphs, and like I mentioned uh, last week, is any period of, of change that is three months in consecutive order uh, is something to pay attention to. So if it's if it's on a downturn, a, a, a decline month after month after month for three months, it's something to be very aware of and to start paying attention to. If it goes down one month and goes up one month and down, down, up, 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 down, down, up, uh, that's just normal. So not as much uh, caution to be to be uh, exercised, but definitely pay attention to the trends there if it's trending three months um, in one direction or the other. <clears throat> Another uh, some other external drivers: median home price. So this is for Colorado. You can see the median home price has shot up quite a bit. Um, another thing you want to be paying attention to is delinquency rates um, on real estate. Uh, for residential and commercial. So if loans start defaulting back, like you see on the, the left-hand side of the right chart in 2007, as those are shooting up, you know that landscaping is eventually going to be coming to an end or consumer de demand is going to definitely uh, start to decrease. Uh, home prices as well. This is for Colorado. This is the Schiller Index. You'll see this for your specific area. You could look this up. Uh, but you'll see, once again, the tremendous growth in home price. Um, and this is all adjusted for in inflation. Now, there's uh, two two things that I want you to get out of this. Number one, as home prices shoot up, people have more equity. They feel richer. They refinance their home. They take money out and they redo their landscaping or put that pool in or the outdoor kitchen or the water feature. Um, and that's great, but there also reaches a point where if home prices climb too sharply, all of a sudden people aren't going to be able to afford homes and it's going to be um, counteractive to the growth and actually be damaging to our industry. So something to definitely be aware of. And we are approaching that range for sure. 30-year um, mortgages, I always look at interest rates as well. So as interest rates increase on homes, people stop buying as expensive homes and they, they stop spending as much money on landscaping as well. So as interest rates increase, uh, bond prices typically fall and uh, so portfolios decrease, people feel less rich, they, they tend not to spend as much money on um, luxury items such as landscaping or hiring out landscape maintenance. The same thing with uh, in the commercial space, as interest rates increase, the cost of construction increases and people will maybe take less projects online and maybe they will spend less money on enhancements when it comes to maintaining their properties and assets. And then uh, finally, in unemployment rates. So you'll notice here with unemployment rates, it's actually, um, it's, you'll, you'll notice the, the climb is, is correlated, is, is um, inversely correlated with building permits. So as you notice, uh, building permits tanked, unemployment rises when building permits tank. So um, unemployment rates are a good indicator. As those start to rise, uh, people are not going to have as much disposable income, once again, to be spending on their landscaping. So these are just a few external drivers to be paying attention to. But the idea here is that your company needs to develop these strategic tools 
to make better forecasts and to make better decisions. It's not enough to just create strategies uh, through guessing. You have to have data behind it. And these these few things that I showed you, there's many more, but I just, the few things that I showed you will help you to be more predictive and more strategic in your business when setting strategy and for coming up with ideas for surviving the cyclical nature of our industry. Whether that is cyclical from a seasonality standpoint, from summer to winter, or whether it's cyclical from an economy standpoint, which is uh, every three to five years on average, we hit uh, a recession. So uh, both of these um, these scenarios can be handled by paying attention to external drivers. Okay, so let's get into the next section here. So what is strategy then, and why do companies need it? So I get a, a variety of responses when I ask companies what strategy is. So whenever I'm, I'm teaching at a conference, I'll ask companies, I'll say, so what is strategy anyways? And a lot of them look perplexed, or some of them come up with uh, simple answers, such as a plan um, or a roadmap. Those are some common responses. And that's true. And strategy, when it comes down to it, strategy is a plan to ward off competition. In other words, strategy is an antidote to competition. Strategy is what enables firms to earn higher than industry average profit. And we'll get into that here in a second. But the, the, the most basic definition of strategy is it's an antidote to competition. So what's the history on strategy? So where, how did strategy come about? Now, strategy has been around for uh, centuries, right? If you go back to um, uh, empires in antiquity, they had some sort of strategy to help them win battles and to help them win wars. And that carried on over time. And uh, the same kind of thing happened in our country, and you look at when we were engaged in World War One and World War Two, uh, we were in, we were practicing a lot of different strategies to win on the battlefield. Well, then back in the the 1960s, Michael Porter, who's a Harvard professor, and Bruce Henderson of, of the Boston Consulting Group, these were two intellectual giants who really started putting. Um, this framework together for corporate strategy. And what they realized is that the business environment was really lacking a framework for strategy. And what was going on and what, what happened for a number of decades is people would um, come out of wartime and they would take these things and these principles, these strategic principles that they learned during war, and they would apply them and teach them in business schools and students would learn these things and they come out of business school and they apply them to the organization. That's why we see, you know, the hierarchical structure of businesses with organization charts. You know, the CEO is almost the general and then it uh, trickles down from there, very similar to how it's organized in uh, military type situations. But Michael Porter and Bruce Henderson, they, um, they created uh, the framework for strategy. And the framework that they created was a traditional strategy. So you see there in this chart, the, um, the light blue, you'll notice that it's coming online in the, the late 50s, early 60s. And this is where uh, Michael Porter came out with a book called Competitive Advantage and really solidified this idea and started uh, proclaiming this throughout the business world. And this is where it started taking off. Now, traditional strategy is based on the concept of getting big and dominating your competition. So if you can get big and dominate through scale, then you can win in the marketplace. Um, and this was very effective back in the days when the value drivers were different, but as value drivers change, which we'll talk about here in a second, when they change, traditional strategy no longer works. So now it's not about being the biggest and dominating, rather it's more about being agile and innovating. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that change, but you'll notice here on this chart that there's still a tremendous amount of companies still use traditional strategy. And on the side here, I have a table. These are some frameworks that come out of traditional strategy that might be familiar to you. SWOT, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Uh, five forces, that's Michael Porter's uh, five forces. Three C's, seven S's, and six sigma. So these are traditional strategy frameworks. But strategy is much more than just taking a SWOT analysis of your company, writing down your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and then coming up with some tactical ideas and then running out and, um, and, and executing. 
So strategy is more of a disciplined process. So the reason why I show this slide is because traditional strategies dominate the marketplace, but this is the underlying flaw of why strategic plans tend not to stick and create success in the landscape industry. So even furthermore, Michael Porter and these uh, and their other intellectual giants who were building these traditional frameworks, they came up with the idea that if you were able to create a sustainable competitive advantage, and you'll see this term um, quite a bit out there, but the idea is if you could get your team together, you come up with a sustainable competitive advantage, then uh, you see the ramp up of the green dotted line, and then it just stays flat, and then you have a competitive advantage forever. Well, once again, this is true in a time back in the 60s and 70s and 80s where we were having high GDP growth in the U.S. and where we were um, the, the world leader, right? And we were, we were innovating, productivity was increasing, and these types of principles um, applied. But now things have definitely changed. And traditional strategy uh, doesn't work because sustainable competitive advantage is a myth. Because if you think you could just come up with a competitive advantage and sustain it, you're sorely mistaken. I mean, consider Blockbuster, consider Sears, consider Borders, et cetera, et cetera. These were all companies that had sustainable advantages for long periods of time, and then their businesses were completely eradicated by disruptors such as Netflix, right? Amazon, so on and so forth. So really what it looks like and what we're dealing with as uh, companies in the construction industry, especially as landscape companies, is this blue line. And it's all about ramping up, you know, creating strategic plans, ramping up, capitalizing on opportunities, followed by the blue line. And then as those opportunities become saturated and everybody copies and everybody catches on, then we reinvent ourselves and then there's a period of strategic change and then we ramp up and we capitalize on opportunities. And this is how it looks. So competitive advantage is more like a wave rather than a straight line. So let's let's compare some different strategy approaches for the landscape industry. So I've, as I've worked with multiple companies in this space, what I've noticed is that um, they follow an old approach that is archaic and that doesn't work. So most companies, strategic planning looks like this. They get a core team together and they go off-site and usually they'll, they'll go on some type of retreat to the mountains or to the beach or et cetera, et cetera. And during this retreat, they'll get together in a room and they'll talk about um, what types of things do we want to do this year? And what, of our, what are our strategic priorities? And what are our strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats? And they'll come up with these laundry lists. And what they do is they leave with a very tactical plan of just things to check off the list. You know, they, they basically create a laundry list. And in fact, one company we were talking with, they left and they had over 80 initiatives for the year. And when I talked to the executive, I said, well, how did that work out? Looking back, he said, well, we, we accomplished about 30 of them. And I said, okay, well, that's not a very effective process if you're setting 80 initiatives and you're only accomplishing 30. Even worse, if you're setting 80 initiatives, I mean, your company is going to be completely confused and overcommitted and that complexity is going to kill the business. So let's let's compare the two different approaches. What is typically done and what should be done. So when it comes to vision, setting vision for your business, most companies take the old approach and they in, they create it internally. They generate the vision internally. It's a top-down vision. So the the top management team they say this is who we want to be. This is our vision for the future, and then they cram it down everybody's throat, and then they get frustrated when people don't buy in. But this is a, a, a definitely a very pervasive approach and a very flawed approach, because your vision can't be internal, but rather we argue that it should be external, and it should be shared. The vision should be shared amongst all levels of the organizations, the, whether you have irrigation techs involved, whether you have um, a account managers, estimators, designers, um, vice presidents, project managers, you know, everybody should be involved. This should be a shared approach. Um, same thing with values. <clears throat> so often companies come up with values and they say, these are our values of the company. We believe in honesty and respect and innovation and tech, whatever that may be. Um, <clears throat> the values of the old approach are company-centric. They're all focused on me, 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 me. What 
what my values are for my company. Now, that should be uh, reversed, and it should be your values should be more customer centric. So you should be considering what are the values of your customer, not what are the values necessarily of your company. Now I'm not saying you throw out your company values, but if you don't understand what your customer values are and build a strategy around your customers, then you are going down the wrong path. And so many companies cannot even tell me what their customer values are. Uh, the goals, you know, I'll run through some of these more quickly, but the goal, the old approach, being uh, the best versus being unique, it's not about being the best. It's about being unique, okay, being different. Uh, the strategy approach, uh, classical versus, uh, classical is traditional versus being collaborative and adaptive. Those are two different approaches. Uh, being big versus agile. Uh, the leadership culture, independent, means uh, everybody is doing things very independently. You have a bunch of leaders doing things independently or dependently on one leader versus interdependent. It's a totally different type of leadership culture. Uh, planning cycles. Uh, in the old approach, companies will create a strategy for one to three years out. So they're assuming that we work in a predictable, uh, stable industry, which we're not. So why create a three-year plan if our industry can quickly change in 18 months? So we we um, like companies to create short monthly iterative uh, plans. And then uh, managing relationships versus building relationships and then goals. You know, a lot of the goals are performance related versus learning related. So it's a fundamental shift. This table is a fundamental shift in the industry of where landscape companies need to go in order to create strategies to survive the cyclical nature. I mean, you can't be uh, straddling uh, the old approach and new approach. You have to choose which side you're going to be on. And if you're on the old approach, I'll tell you, it's not going to work. Um, and, and I'll explain why here in the next slide. But if you can't, you can't expect to solve new problems with old frameworks. And the reason why is because we have to shift our strategies based on the value drivers that have shifted. So if you look at the old economy, you know that that world I talked about, the traditional strategy uh, applies to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and so on and so forth. The old success drivers were really about physical assets in financial capital. So companies that had physical assets, they had more trenchers and mowers and skidsters and tractors and backhoes, all these different things, more physical assets, those were the ones who could get bigger jobs, okay? Um, the, the financial capital, if they had more financial capital, they'd have the working capital to do these bigger jobs, right? And they'd have the financial capital to get bonding and so on and so forth. So the old success drivers were about companies who can dominate via physical assets, more trucks, more equipment, and financial capital, a bigger balance sheet, more cash flow, more profit. But the new success drivers have shifted. Now, financial capital is more abundant, okay? With income taxes being almost at historical lows, interest rates being definitely at historical lows, you can see out there, we are awash in capital, okay? Uh, companies are sitting on a tremendous amount of cash and they don't know what to do with it. So um, banks are starting to realize this and they're lending more and more. Interest rates, like I said, are, are low, so the cost of capital is really low. So when financial capital is more abundant and you could get access to physical assets because lending requirements are a lot lower, then no longer are those the value drivers. The new success drivers really depend on intellectual assets, so having the right people and building the right capabilities within them. And then the human capital, having the right people on your team who can actually go out and execute and do a great job when it comes to delivering customer experience strategy or whether it comes down to delivering an operational strategy. Uh, competitive advantage, so out of this stems competitive advantage. And you know if your strategy is working, um, by measuring whether or not you have a competitive advantage. Now you may stop me and ask and say, well, how do I know if I have a competitive advantage? So last week we talked about profit and cash flow. And so really when you look at profit, if you look at your company's profit on your income statement, if you have industry average profit, okay, so for um, for your industry, for your geography, for your size of business, if you're at industry average profit, then you're just doing a good job. You're just following the industry. If you're above industry average profit, you have some type of competitive advantage. If you have below industry average profit, you do not have a competitive advantage. Even if you think you have a competitive advantage, you do not. So this is how you quickly tell. 
Now it's interesting because as I work with companies, um, I'll be talking with them and they'll say, you know, Steve, we're doing really well. Last year we were at a 2% profit and this year we're at a 5% profit. And I, I think it's really because we have XYZ as a competitive advantage and uh, things are really, really good. I say, okay, that's great, but industry average profit for your segment is 7%. So you're below industry average profit. So even though you've improved profitability, which is great, you're still not capturing all the value that you could if you had the right strategy. So determining which strategy is most appropriate really comes down to determining where you're at as a business. So there's not a one-size-fits-all, out-of-the-box strategy approach that fits every single business. So when I work with companies, I always consider four different boxes. So companies that are in a growth stage, right? So maybe they're below that million dollar mark and they need to get to at least a million dollars to have adequate scale. Um, or companies that have already surpassed that and they're looking to take it beyond the next level, go from three to 12 or go from uh, 15 to 25 or whatever that is um, in revenue. So they may, be a, they may need a growth strategy which looks very, very different from an innovative strategy. Innovative strategy, I've worked with companies who are very well established, they've been around for 30 years, but their processes are so antiquated. And this is what I talked about in the first webinar with technology. You know, Companies that rely on paper processes, paper companies that are using like Excel to do estimating and they're not using a web-based um, program designed specifically for the landscape industry. Uh, companies that are uh, doing hand-drawn design and not relying on that or companies that don't have uh, an integrated 360 degree uh, project management software that's web-based, I mean, these companies need to innovate. So this is where innovation strategy looks very different and these types of strategies are gonna be based around the idea of, of digitizing processes and, and getting uh, technology implemented so they can sustain a competitive advantage or gain a competitive advantage. And then revive strategies really come into play with companies that have been in business for a while or maybe they're ramping up, but the pro Profits and cash flow are just not there. <clears throat> so it's interesting. Some businesses we work with, uh, you know, they've been in business for 20, 30, 40 years, and their profitability, they're just barely skimming by at one, two, three percent profit. And that's where they need a revive strategy. <clears throat> and then finally, um, exit strategy. If uh, if the owner of the company is looking to exit within three to five years, you have to have an entirely different strategy than the three I just explained. You have to start preparing yourself. Uh, for future exit. So uh, we were working with a tree company and the owner was looking at exiting within three years. So we started uh, changing the revenue mix and, and creating strategies for um, getting more recurring revenue and building a stronger base and building capabilities among people so he could exit and have a, a strong exit. And uh, he was able to do so and walk away with um, several million dollars. But the point here is you have to have the right strategy um, based on where you're at in your business life cycle. So what items must be included in a strategic plan? <clears throat> so in my book uh, that I wrote, it's called Delivering Value. I mentioned this in the other webinars. Uh, I have this growth triangle. And this is the, the whole center of the book, is this growth triangle. This is what the book is based on. But you'll see here, um, there's three different sides of the triangle, strategy, leadership, and finance, or, um, and this is based on the program that we put on, strategic financial leadership. This is what the whole webinar series is built on. Um, strategy, leadership, finance, strategy, finance, leadership, and within these, you have six different value drivers. So when it comes down to strategy, it really comes down to purpose, having a purpose, why your business exists, um, and a plan to go out and execute that strategy. When it comes to leadership, it comes down to process and people when it comes to finance, profit, and product. In the center of it all is the customer. So whenever you take an approach to strategy, your strategy has to be all about the customer, okay? 
your strategy has to be customer centric. It's not about what you want to do as a company, but it's what your customer wants and what you could do in order to create create a great customer experience for them. That's why the customer is at the center of the triangle. The other part of strategy is that you can't just focus on one of these value drivers. You can't just focus on um, profit and ignore everything else because you will uh, people will leave, your processes will fall apart, and your product will suffer. So same kind of thing, you can't just focus on your process and ignore profit or ignore um, your people or, uh, or things will suffer as well. So you have to take a holistic approach and touch each of these six value drivers. So when you take an approach to strategy, you have to consider this triangle. The other thing that's in the book is this whole strategy circuit. So in the strategy circuit, it's all about um, creating a plan, communicating that plan to customers, to your employees, and to vendors and other stakeholders, and then executing on that plan, and then making adjustments along the way. So you notice plan, communicate, and execute is all part of the intended strategy. So we can sit back in our offices in the winter or you know, whenever you formulate strategy, and you can create the most beautiful um, strategic plan, and you can format it and put it, on, put it on beautiful paper and wordsmith it so it sounds excellent. But that's all a part of the intended strategy. When you go out to execute, you'll notice that an emergent strategy evolves. So you may uh, have a great plan for 2018, you're implementing technology, you're entering new markets, and then all of a sudden a recession hits or something else, um, you may lose a key employee or uh, something else happens and then a new emergent strategy will come and you'll have to be able to adjust. So when I talk about strategy, it really comes down to being able to plan, that's that's one part of it, but being able to execute and being able to adjust based on what's going on in the market and based on those um, key indicators that I showed you at the beginning of the webinar is really key. Because if you can't adjust quickly, this is where you become hosed and you struggle when the economy changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, purpose and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the components of plan, those two sides, those two value drivers of that side of the triangle. So first, purpose. This is this is always interesting to me. I'm always surprised when I talk with companies and business owners about how many do not know the purpose of their company. So I ask them, why does your company exist? And oftentimes I get blank stares. So ask yourself this and think about this. Why does your company exist? Now, some people will say, my company exists because my company exists in order to generate a profit. And I say, yes, that's great, right? That's very noble of you to want to earn a profit. And I think that's absolutely critical. However, that's not the purpose of the business. Profit is a vehicle to, to accomplish your purpose. That's all it is. Profit's a vehicle to accomplish your purpose. So your purpose has to be more, more tangible than that, more inspiring than that. So Simon Sinek, if you look this up, Simon Sinek, he has a great TED Talk where he talks about starting with why. And this is from his TED Talk, uh, The Golden Circle. But you see here, the why is at the center, then it goes to how, to what. And really, when you develop your strategy, you have to start with the why. You have to say, why do we exist? And then move out for, outward. Okay, how are we gonna um, compete out in the marketplace? And then what are we gonna create? Um, in the video, he does a great job explaining this, uh, the difference between companies like Adele, Dell computer or HP who starts with what we're going to create computers how are we going to when we're going to vertically vertically integrate we're going to sell directly to um, consumers and why and the why is to maximize shareholder value versus Apple who starts from the center and moves outward and they say why do we exist because we want to transform the way people interact with technology we want to enrich lives that's why we exist how are we going to do this through innovation by beautiful design and what are we going to do we're just going to happen to create ipads and iphones um, and people really buy the why they don't buy the what i mean how many people do you see driving around with dell stickers or hp stickers on their car versus apple so people buy the why 
So you have to have a compelling why, and you have to understand what your company's why is. So you can um, use this this template here and and fill in the box and and really start to understand what is your company's why, and it has to be inspirational, and it has to be believable too. But this is how you're going to rally up the employees, and this is how you're going to keep employees around. It is by giving them a why that they can buy into and really um, really share. <clears throat> When it comes to a plan, you have to have two things, where and how to compete. So let's talk about both. So where to compete really comes down to what geographies are you gonna compete in, okay? Um, what products and services are you gonna offer? Uh, what channels are you gonna go through? Are you gonna be working directly with homeowners? You're gonna be working with builders and architects and uh, other industry partners? Um, are you gonna be going uh, after commercial markets or residential? Or are you gonna be going after different segments of those markets, high end, um, or mass production or, or whatever segment you choose to compete in, but you really have to define where you're going to compete. And you, you really have to create boundaries around where you're going to compete. Because as your business grows, the last thing you want is to go off in all different types of directions. So I was working with a company and they did not have where to compete solidified. And when they hired on a new business development person, that, that person was all over the place, bidding jobs out of state, um, building, bidding jobs in, in areas that they had no uh, expertise in. So they created a lot of confusion throughout the company. So you really have to define where to compete. And this is really gonna make about 80% of your success. And then how to compete really comes down to how are you gonna win, right? And uh, customer experience, and we, I talked about this in the, the first webinar, but customer experience in our industry and the experience that the customer has throughout the process it is really what differentiates landscape companies. If customers have a great experience with you, you're going to have repeat business, employees are going to be happier, you're going to be able to charge higher prices, and it's going to be a great, you're going to be able to create a competitive advantage. But the, the key is when it comes to how to compete you have to understand who your customers are and what they're really looking to do so on this slide ask ask yourself these two questions and and go back to your uh, your leadership team or your company as a whole and really start to um, uncover these things by asking uh, what progress is your customer trying to make by hiring you okay what are they really trying to accomplish and what causes your customer to purchase a particular product or service from you okay so if you don't understand this then you're going to be missing out on huge opportunities so let me give you an example when I'm my landscape company we were doing a front uh, yard landscape project for um, for a homeowner in the foothills just to the um, west of, of Denver in a, a place called Littleton so we're in the foothills. We're doing a front yard landscaping. It's just a small job. It's about fifty thousand bucks, and uh, we were putting in some boulders and um, some other plants and re changing the the bed lines and, and so on and so forth. And while we were in the middle of construction, uh, a lady drives by, and she asked if I could uh, come to her house to look at some drainage issues. So as I um, inquired more about the details of the project she explained that she's looking for a French drain and inside I kind of rolled my eyes I mean not not um, externally but internally I kind of rolled my eyes and thought oh you know a little French drain what like a two thousand dollar job or three thousand dollar job we're too busy for this but before I, I said that and turned her down I thought you know what maybe I'll just swing by so I swung by her house and when I got to the house and we started walking around, I started to really understand the progress that she was trying to make, what was causing her to hire my product or service. And when it came down to it, what I really uncovered was she wasn't necessarily <clears throat> buying a French drain. She was buying a, a, a vehicle to reduce stress and friction in her marriage. Let me explain. Recently, their basement had flooded, okay? So they, they had heavy rains, the basement flooded, the whole entire basement, all the carpet had to be ripped up, memorabilia had to be uh, thrown out. Uh, it was very, very traumatic experience. It's about $100,000 in repairs, and, and not to mention all the lost artifacts and like the family memorabilia and memories that, that were destroyed, um, that were stored in the basement. 
so as I understood this, I dug deeper and, and asked her, so how was this impacting your, your home life, your work life, yeah, your marriage life, so on and so forth. And um, I realized that this was causing a huge strain. So we walked the property more, and then I realized that this wasn't a French drain. This was a complete redo of the landscape. Now, when I asked her um, if she talked to other landscape companies, she explained that another company had been out there, and they drew up beautiful plans. And when she asked them about the drainage, the uh, designer said, oh, yeah, the drainage. Um, we could just do that on a TNM basis. I didn't really think about that. I didn't really include that in the design. And she is immediately um, infuriated and, and pushed her off the push them off the property. So as I understood this in the first meeting and I understand the progress that they're trying to make, I, uh, I, I went back to the office, we drafted up plans, we came back and met, and the first thing on my bid proposal was drainage. The first thing on my plan was drainage. The first thing I talked about was drainage, 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 okay? <laughs> then I went into the rest of the landscape and explained the water feature and the path that we're gonna do and the lighting and so on and so forth. And what it ended up doing is it created tremendous trust with her because she understood the progress. She understood that I understood the progress she was trying to make. I understood her values. It ended up being a, um, over $200,000 for this uh, front yard renovation. So this is just one example. If I would have just ignored the, the progress she was trying to make and looked at it on the, the surface level and said, hey, this is just a French drain, I would have missed out on a, I would have missed out on a, a huge opportunity, a multi, um, uh, a several hundred thousand dollar project. Steve, it might so, be a hard uh, question. It might be a hard question to answer, but how many landscape companies do you think miss the the progress that a client's trying to make <laughs> and leave that kind of money on the table? I think a, a tremendous amount, Joe. I think that's a great question, I th and I think the reason why is because we're taught so often in sales training books or sales training seminars or in schools or in other programs to just focus on the needs, right? So in, the, in this slide here, um, they, they go to the customer and they say, what are your needs? And the customer, they, they I mean, they immediately spit out, oh, I, I need new landscaping. Okay, okay, what, what do you want? What kind of elements do you want? Do you want a patio? Do you want an outdoor kitchen? Hurry up, we need to get through this because I got another appointment back to back, right? And they rush through this process and they leave with a list of needs, and then they try to design a landscape, and when they come back to present it, they are perplexed of why the customer doesn't buy into the design, why they're not passionate about the design. Yeah. Now, the reason why um, they're not passionate about the design is because it's missing the other two dimensions, the circumstances and other motivations. So let me <clears throat> explain this quickly here. Um, when it comes down to circumstances and other motivations, uh, if you go to one homeowner, let, let's just say I'm a designer and I go to two brand new homes, okay? Both of them need landscaping. Both of them need landscaping. If I just leave it there, then I walk away and with, with enough ideas to come back and, and present a design, but I'm not tying into the emotional aspect of the project. Let's consider the circumstances. One homeowner who has the new home, they work all the time. They're never home. They care less about the landscaping. They need it done just to get the, the HOA off their back. So uh, they, they need to get it done at some point, but it's not a, a huge priority. Um, so their circumstances are different. But what about the circumstances of somebody, let's take a, a mother who's at home with kids and a dog, the husband's away at work, and, um, they have a dirt yard, and every time it rains, the dog runs through the house with the muddy feet. They, she's called the carpet cleaner multiple times. You know, the kids can't go outside. It's driving her absolutely nuts. So if you just go back with a, a design based on needs, then you say, hey, here's the landscaping. This is what I'm trying to sell you. If you go back with needs and circumstances, then you come back and say, here's the design, and here's how we're going to be able to install it within the next three weeks in order for you to get your kids outside and get the dogs um from running through the mud. So tying in the, the circumstances and the other motivations behind the customer really helps you to start crafting where you compete and, and how you win in those spaces. So um, I'll leave you uh, here with this uh, this kind of matrix here, but really filling this out, what products or services do you offer, what geographies are you competing in, what channels and how do you sell to your, your customers and then other considerations. You know, going through your team and filling this out would be a good exercise.
When it comes to how to compete, uh, it really comes down to um, companies can compete either on low cost, which is the gray area, which is about 60% of companies compete on low cost, not low price, low cost, there's a difference. Uh, differentiation, about 30% of companies compete on differentiation, and then 10% of companies compete on control of a network or key resource. So they may have a storefront among a, a thoroughfare, or they may have um, a, a nursery as part of their design build uh, business, which is a control uh, key resource, or they may have a patent on some type of technology. So it, those are more rare, um, but most companies compete in differentiation or low cost. The key is you can't compete in both areas. So you can't compete necessarily, you can't be compete on differentiation, which um, is being unique and great customer experience and all these other things, um, at the same time being low cost. You kind of have to choose one or the other. And this is where companies fail because it's hard to make the trade-offs. I mean, that's why Walmart, you go in there, it's hard to find help. Um, the stores are just really basic, really cheap linoleum flooring. Um, it's because they are competing on low cost, which allows them to offer low prices. Um, but if you imagine if you walked into a Walmart and they had nice hardwood floors, they had uh, tons of customer service representatives helping you out um, and associates helping you out, uh, it, they would have a higher cost structure and, and they just they wouldn't be able to compete in both areas. So the same thing's true with landscape companies. You have to choose um, which space you're going to compete in. And then here, uh, you have to start looking at your business and understanding what are some sta what are the standard elements of your business and what are the unique elements. And what I mean by the standard elements, these are just standard processes or resources or uh, capabilities that you have. And some things are just very standard. So these are just like table stake items, uh, like having a nice website, having a nice trucks, uh, presentable trucks, um, having experienced crews. All these things are just standard. When it comes down to it, the standard things you just have to be median at. Um, the unique elements of your business, those are the things you want to invest heavily into and build capabilities. So let me explain. I mean, when's the last time you were at a bid table with a customer and they said, wow, you know, it is really hard deciding between your bid and this other company. You guys are basically the same price. But at the end of the day, the reason why we hired you is because you have a really, really good um, accounting manager you have a really good payroll process I mean every Friday your paychecks are cut on time um, that's why we hired you so some of the things are just standard elements so you don't have to be the best at everything in your business some parts of your business you just have to be median but then other things like technology capabilities right or um, financial capabilities uh, or bidding capabilities right and in other other parts of the business you want to invest heavily into in order to, to strengthen your advantages and that's that goes back to that first webinar if you haven't seen that I'd highly recommend go back to that first webinar I talk a lot about this um, there but if you're if you're relying on paper processes if you don't have a web-based um, integrated uh, software in your business at this time uh, you're really behind the eight, eight ball and these are unique elements where you you need to invest in so I, I threw this slide in here. This is, is kind of a, an interesting spot, but um, I threw this slide in because I want to discuss how and when to uh, secure financial capital. Because from a cyclical nature, like how to survive the cyclical nature of our business, oftentimes companies ask me about how do they survive during the off season in the winter. And what I'll say here is it really comes down to assets equal liabilities plus equity. That's that's the accounting equation. Um, but this is just for your reference. The best time to secure financing in order to be able to actually execute on your strategic plan is when things are going well. So if you have good profits right now, um, if your uh, your business is healthy and strong, and we're in a good economy right now, now's the time to go secure those lines of credit, even if you don't need the line of credit right now, because the worst time to secure the line of credit is when you actually need it. So when you're uh, desperate for it, the banks are going to um, not give you favorable terms or even reject you. So definitely have the financing in place to allow you to execute on your strategy. And here's just some um, bank requirements. You can look here and uh, that will help guide you.
so the whole idea here, like I said, is um, you have to have a holistic approach to strategy to deliver value. You have to um, reach all those different, the six value drivers in your strategy. So what are some things that you should monitor to make sure you're on, you're on track? I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, um, but you can go back through the slides. You can reach out for more information um, if, if you uh, want to follow up. But I'm going to just run through a few things. These are not exhaustive, but these are just a few things to get you thinking. So first, market trends. So on this slide, this is a recap of what I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Definitely be paying attention to market trends every single month. Make this part of your strategy and your strategy review process. In the green box, I give some examples. Definitely check those out. Number two, marketing. Okay, Make sure you're monitoring your marketing and understanding your ROI. Okay, So there's like Google Analytics. Make sure your website is tied into Google Analytics so you can be monitoring trends. Look at this other box over here. Look at your return on investment, customer acquisition costs, so on and so forth. But monitor your your marketing efforts. Is your monit is your or are your marketing efforts um, successful and are they related to your strategy? So you need to be able to measure that. The, the third thing is customer types. So really understanding who your customers are and and how satisfied are they with your overall customer experience. And there's different tools like Net Promoter Score, uh, which is a, a simple tool. It does have some faults, but it's a simple tool to to use. Um, but really interviewing customers, collecting as much data about your customers that you can to understand who they are and what they value. Um, cash flow. Cash flow is huge. Make sure that um, you're forecasting out your um, your projected revenues and your costs and you're, you're monitoring cash flow. There's a difference between profit and cash flow. This is what I talked about last week in the financial webinar. Uh, but you look here in this example, in July, uh, the company had, in this example, the company had $82,000 in profit, but they had negative $124,000 in, in uh, cash flow. And this is so common. So you have to have some type of forecast on both profit and cash flow because you can be profitable but not have the cash flow. And that's what we talked about. But here's some examples of things to, to measure. Number five, look at profit per, per type. So whether that's um, per segment, whether you're in a... Um, different segments such as commercial maintenance, commercial construction, residential, design build, so on and so forth, but know which lines of business achieve higher profits and which ones to pursue and not to pursue. And then look at job performance. So I talked about profit erosion um, last time or in the first webinar. Uh, I talked about job performance and how profit erodes. So definitely understand where you're losing money and where profits are eroding on your jobs. This is something you should definitely monitor from an executional standpoint. And then uh, finally, employee, employee performance. Understanding employee performance and who's performing well and who's not performing well and how satisfied are they with their jobs and their likelihood to stay around. So you have to be monitoring these things. This, this is not all inclusive, but it's something you should definitely be aware of. And I'll, I'll close with, uh, with, with this slide uh, or with these next two slides. Considerations, um, strategy, make sure you are using the right approach. We talked about that. Uh, capabilities, make sure that you're investing in your people. Remember, intellectual assets and human capital are the new value drivers. Make sure that you're building the skills. You're giving the training that, you're, that your employees need in order to be effective. Making sure you have a process to execute on your strategy is key. Uh, making sure you're in, incorporating analytics like I just showed you into your business to be able to measure success. Making sure you have the right operating model, which includes having the right technology in order for you to do your job efficiently and effectively. And then finally, uh, making sure you have the financing to implement your plan and to survive when things turn down. But like I said in my other webinars, think big, start small, act quickly. That's the challenge uh, for you. And then um, also remember that the Strategic Financial Leadership Academy is one academy that we offer uh, to companies in the landscape space to help you develop these tools. This is just, you know, um, a, a great primer to get uh, a seed planted in your head, but there are other resources out there to help you be more effective and to be more strategically minded. And with that, I will, uh, I will close. Uh, but I, I'll open it up to a Q&A, but before I do so, on the left there, you'll see my name, you'll see my, um, 
my contact information, like Joe said, it'll be on the website. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Connect with me. Connect with Joe. Um, we're here to help you guys. We are passionate about this stuff. We love this kind of stuff. Uh, we love helping companies grow and become all that they are intended to be. So I appreciate your time. I am so grateful to be able to do these um, these three webinars with Dynascape. What a what a fascinating company. I mean, talk about innovative, cutting edge uh, with products that enhance the customer experience. Dynascape is that. So I am grateful to be able to partner up with a company like that on this three-part series. So I'll, I'll turn the time over to Joe, but just sure. wanted to leave with that. Thanks so much, Steve. And you know what? I think we share a why in what we do. You know, you referenced uh, Simon Sinek's um, uh, TED Talk and uh, his book, uh, Start With Why, goes into a whole bunch of case studies. But you know, I think we share a why in that we want to enhance what landscape business owners are doing and their profitability and productivity. Uh, and so I really think we share that why. Um, so I really appreciate those kind words and uh, just um, I'm a really big fan of um, the whole start with why and understanding, you know, why companies um, exist and why they do things um, more than just to make money. Um, but we do have uh, some questions. And uh, one of the questions leads back to near the beginning of the webinar. Um, you talked about, um, you know, just looking at your backlog isn't a good indicator um, of the strength of your business. You know, if you've got a backlog that goes into next spring, let's say, you know, you're booked out. Um, a lot of the clients that I talk to or, you know, even um, prospects that are looking at um, investing in um, a business solution uh, to run their business, they say, hey, look, I, I've got a, a bunch of work. It's not like we don't have anything going on. We've got a lot of work. We're booked into next spring or next fall. Uh, so things look really good. But you mentioned that that's not always the best indicator. How do you um, talk to business owners like that that are in that mindset? Well, you know, we're booked out um, with all this work, but how do you talk to them about, you know, having great cash flow so that they can actually get to that point where they're executing on that backlog rather than having to worry about one job to the next? No, and that I mean that's definitely a great point, and and that's the the problem that I see is is apathy with that. Exactly what you're talking about, Joe. Is you know companies have a tremendous amount of backlog, the economy is going strong, and they say, why do I need to innovate? Why do I need to adopt technology? Why do I need to um, invest in strategy or improve the financial performance of my firm? Uh, we're good. We you know everything's good and smooth sailing. And what I say to them is. Um, you may have tremendous backlog, but number one, you don't know, is that backlog profitable? And is it gonna provide the cash flow that you need to survive? Because as you as you uh, start to do these projects, if one customer doesn't pay you, you're in a very tough situation. But um, number two, um, a lot of things can change with that backlog. I mean, you can you could have crews quit, you could have employees recruited by other firms, which is happening all over the place with the labor shortage. Um, and, and the third thing is just back to that complacency thing. You cannot be complacent. Even if you have backlog and things are all uh, fine and well, um, you have to be constantly reinventing yourself. Um, otherwise, you're going to be left behind. So, yeah, great question, Joe. Cool. Thanks. Um, you know, and one of the um, other things you're talking about is when you're building a strategic plan, um, sometimes... Um, you know, you may have the right people in your organization, um, and collaboration seems to be one of the crucial elements into the new approach of building a strategic plan. But how do you get those people in your organization that may not share the same vision to be as collaborative in developing that strategic plan so that everybody's on the same page and executing with excellence as you get into that stage? Yeah, and that's a great point. So uh, I've worked with companies that have several hundred people down to companies that have, you know, just a few people. And I think the key is, is to get everybody um, to buy in, is, is to start creating a culture of action. So when, I think the biggest thing that destroys morale and what causes people not to buy in is because they say, oh, here's another flavor of the day, the flavor of the month. Um, here comes another strategic planner initiative. And, you know, we're, it's just another thing that is going to be on our plate and we're not going to actually execute on or, or incorporate or just another thing we're going to talk about. I think to get everybody bought in um, comes down to starting to execute and starting to make change. Because when you start 
making decisions and you start acting, then employees say, oh, okay, yeah, we are moving, right? The train is moving and I want to get on board. So that that's definitely key. And it's also, but it, it comes back to that why, like you said, Joe, um, you know, you have to have a compelling why because now employees, they have a lot of options. They could go to a lot of different companies. They can go to different industries because there's such a big labor shortage. So you have to be able to attract employees um, by by giving them a, a good reason to want to work at your firm and a good reason to execute the strategy. So absolutely, that's the say there. Great. And you had mentioned um, in one of your slides um, to look at industry averages. Um, I get asked all the time, you know, where should I look to find um, industry benchmarks? How do I know what I'm doing? Uh, where do I fall against, you know, where you know, my peers are doing with businesses in either similar trade areas or even in other states or, uh, you know, north of the border in Canada. Um, where would, where's a good reference point for people to go look um, for benchmarks like that? Yeah, great, great question. So, yeah, we get that all the time as well. So the, the thing is, you can't just Google it, unfortunately, and find it because uh, people make money off um, <laughs> these benchmarks. Now we we don't have like a we don't provide like cultivars benchmark subscription or anything. We subscribe to multiple benchmarks and we have our own benchmarks by working with a bunch of different companies. Uh, but there are subscription based uh, services out there. Like one for example is Bizminer. Um, I, I'm not sure how much that is per year, but uh, you could pay. Sometimes there's several thousand bucks a year, so it, sometimes it doesn't make sense. But um, there are subscriptions out there. Sometimes organizations will uh, come out with some different benchmarks like Planet and, um, you know, like local chapters, landscape chapters uh, that you could uh, look into you know, to get those uh, numbers. But a lot of them, they're paid subscriptions. But I, th I think the key is, is to make sure that you get relevant benchmarks because you don't want to get an average of landscape profitability from California all the way to Boston and every company in between from two hundred thousand dollars in revenue to 20 million in revenue and getting an average profitability on that so it has to be really specific to your area so uh, you can reach out to me if you have more questions on that and I could uh, provide you some tips on on how to get those benchmarks great thanks Steve really appreciate it um, those are the questions we have for now um, there's a couple other that popped up but uh, our time looks like it's running out um, I, I, the the webinar series has been absolutely incredible. The groundswell from uh, the Dynascape community, the landscape industry all around has been huge around this webinar series. We've touched a lot of people. I know that there's a lot of business owners that have really got a lot out of uh, the content that's been put together for this webinar series. Steve, it's absolutely been incredible. I really appreciate uh, the amount of effort and the time uh, that's gone into um, putting this all together. So thank you so much. Um, I do want to thank our promotional partners again. Uh, here they are on the screen. Um, uh, reaching out to uh, the landscape industry wouldn't have been possible without all of our partners. Uh, so thank you so much. Really appreciate um, all of the effort. And, um, you know, we're looking to do more of these kinds of webinars, uh, you know, on top of, um, you know, understanding what uh, Dynascape is all about in our software solutions. Uh, we want to bring high level education to the landscape industry and the Dynascape community. My name is Joe Salami. I'm the product marketing manager with Dynascape. My email address is here. Our phone number is at the bottom. Please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to put you in touch with Steve. His contact information was on the slide previous, but uh, if you'd like, I can definitely get you in touch. He is a excellent uh, resource for your landscape business. If you're looking for um, a fully integrated solution for software, your design, uh, your estimating, production, uh, maintenance, uh, management, get in touch with us. We'll help you out. Steve, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to doing this again. Great. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone. Take care.